we have a few journalists who tell me they have a few things they want to share with us today. Before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to start, as I mentioned before, with uh, a little bit of a hear Governor Kerner in his own voice. And in this case, uh, since one of the themes in our first session was very much about mental health, he'll be talking to a luncheon group about that very subject. This is the 16th Annual Governor's Mental Health Luncheon in 1964. As many of you know, I have been interested in mental health for many, many years. I have seen the resistance or the fear of the recognition of the problem of mental illness for many years. I began to see the breakdown of it, of course, about 1960 and 61, with the voting of the bond issue for the mental health building. Then I saw a further breakdown of the old Victorian philosophy of those who are mentally ill should be hid away somewhere and not be seen. When we received so many requests from people and communities throughout the state of Illinois for the placement of one of the mental health hospital clinics in its area. <clears throat> but yesterday, seeing all these thousands of people come to visit our hospitals. To me, it was a positive indication of a complete breakdown of that old Victorian idea. Because these people didn't come with any idea of curiosity. For those that I saw personally at the Dixon State Hospital on Sunday came because they wanted to see and they wanted to learn. They were escorted through the many buildings, except those, of course, of uh, those areas where we could not open the doors, unfortunately. And this is an area in which we are making great progress because I personally visited many of those. And having visited them over the years, I can see a different atmosphere. And certainly there was a quietness about them now. I didn't say complete quietness, don't misunderstand me but a quietness uh, that I saw relative to what was the situation a number of years ago. But these people coming in and seeing, I know will assist the development of our program. Dollars aren't going to do it, buildings aren't going to do it. It's the devotion of people, because already through certain of the programs that have been in force, we have shown the difference between custodial care and treatment, and only people can do the treatment. So that being here today to do honor to the employees of the Department of the Illinois Department of Mental Health, they're doing so much to make our state the best in the nation in its treatment program for the mentally ill and the mentally retarded. As I have moved from hospital to hospital, I'm delighted to see more and more of the volunteers working at the side of our employees. You know this is part of our program, and I think last Sunday, certainly I hope, has perhaps uh, uh, infected many of the people in the communities, doctor, to come in and to help, because they could see the need of additional qualified people, and we must move ahead on this program. I know that we've spoken to many groups, civic and service groups throughout the state. I think we can expect more and more assistance from them. Again, to all of you who are recognized today, personal congratulations, and thank you so very much from all the people of the state of Illinois. Here's our panel. I want to introduce Robert Hartley. Bob Hartley has worked for Illinois newspapers from 1962 to 1980, primarily covering, covering Illinois' political scene. He's the author or co-author of nine published books about Illinois, including political biographies of Charles Percy, James R. Thompson, Paul Powell, and Paul Simon. His book published in the fall of this year is about the 1948 state elections. 
Although he recently has lived in Colorado and now Arizona, his fascination with Illinois and our politics continues to this day. Bob. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, I want to say as a personal item, it is a certain amount of danger uh, in uh, sitting down at these uh, events like this. As my wife says, don't sit down to talk because your triple chin shows. <laughs> Uh, I'm speaking only for myself and not for any of the panel members here. Uh, if I were to substitute a title for this panel, it would be Views from the Inside. Our panelists are equipped by experience to strip away the press releases and happy talk and give us a candid picture of Otto Kerner, his terms as governor, and his relations with the press. Before turning the memories of Otto Kerner over to our distinguished panelists, let me recall the time of Kerner's inauguration in January 1961, when Kerner left the friendly confines of Chicago and Cook County for the governor's office in Springfield. He learned the realities of Springfield press coverage and those with whom he would share the spotlight. While all of the inaugural attention for a new governor should have cornered the news pages and broadcast error, it was that veteran news hog, Paul Powell, who grabbed the stage. With Republicans holding a one-vote margin in the House of Representatives, Democrat Powell cut a deal that gave him enough so-called Chicago Republican votes to take the speakership. The ordeal lasted a week at high pitch on every front page and at the top of the newscasts, right when Kerner would have been the star. It was the first time a speaker had been named from the minority party. Powell was generous with his pals, but not when it came to headlines, even if the governor was a Democrat. In those long ago days of the early 1960s, the center of Springfield press activity was the Capitol Press Room, a male-dominated clubhouse run by house mother Shelby Voschkin-Sells, who may have, many believed had been in charge there since the days of Abraham Lincoln. Now, this was still the time of newspapers, although TV had made its inroads. So the old bulls of the press John Dreisky of the Daily News, George Taggy of the Tribune, uh, Tom Littlewood, Bob Howard, Bill O'Connell of the Peoria Journal Star were all on hand. But adjoining them were the young bulls, most of whom are sitting here today. Those may have not been the good old days, but they were the days that our panelists were at work. And now a final snapshot. The governor was occasionally seen in Springfield. That's how different things were then. <laughs> now on to our panel and the inside story. Uh, we'll begin with each panelist taking an opening statement or comment. Then we'll do a group grope for a while, and then that'll leave plenty of time for your questions. It's my pleasure to introduce these panelists to you now, whose newspaper and broadcast achievements are legend in Illinois. If you don't know them, when I mention their name, I'll ask them to raise their hand so they'll identify themselves. Gene Callahan. For more than 40 years, Gene worked in the political arena, first as a journalist with the Illinois State Register from 1957 to 1967, the years of Otto Kerner. He spent years as press secretary to Paul Simon, and was a trusted political aide and chief of staff to Alan Dixon. Gene's Rolodex, or whatever passes for it in the electronic age, is admired and respected by everyone. Mike Lawrence. Mike has been involved in Illinois public policy for more than four decades. He covered state government for Lee Enterprises and the Chicago Sun-Times before becoming press secretary to Governor Jim Edgar. In 1997, Mike joined Paul Simon in launching an institute for policy at Southern Illinois University. He served as director of the institute after Paul's death 
and he retired in 2008. Taylor Pensano, as political writer for the <laughs> St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Taylor covered all or parts of the administration of five governors, including Otto Kerner. He retired in 2003 as president of the Illinois Coal Association. He is the author of six books, and it's my understanding that another one is in the making, <laughs> including biographies of governors Richard Ogilvie and Dan Walker. Jack Taylor. Jack has been on the radio and television in Chicago for, get this, 63 years, starting in 1950 at WCFL. He moved to WGN in 1958, doing a variety of shows, and became a TV anchor for WGN in 1970, where he was joined by the familiar faces of Harry Volkman, Len O'Connor, and Jack Brickhouse. Today he's heard on public radio stations in the region. Well, that's the gang before you. Uh, we'll start the round robin with Gene Callahan. Gene? I liked Governor Kerner before he was governor, while he was governor, and after he was governor. His uniqueness for Springfield was something really to behold. He carried Sangman County twice, and that is hard to do for a Democrat. Why was he popular here? Because he did little things. He shopped by himself. He went to the uh, Boy Scout walk 22 some miles, walked about 18 of it until his knee gave out. He saved down states, uh, down, uh, downtown Springfield. He, with the help of the Myers brothers, Bill Gingold and Wally Henderson. And Wally Henderson, by the way, just two weeks ago was named the outstanding citizen of the city of Springfield. They saved downtown just like Governor Ryan, Dick Durbin, and Julie Cellini saved this area here and promoted the State Library and the State Museum. The, he also was known because his dad, or his dad had been a distinguished attorney general, elected twice in the 1930s. His uh, uh, boss, Sir Mac, who was the governor's uh, father-in-law, was well known, not necessarily in Springfield, but he had ties with legislators downstate and people thought that they could trust him. Uh, there are two books that I think stand out during this period that will be deeper than anything we'll discuss today on that time. It's uh, a Boss Cermak by Alex Gottfried, a professor at the University of Washington, is a solid book. And of course, uh, Tom Littlewood's book on Henry Horner is extremely good. I think it captured the 30 period uh, better uh, than anything that I've read. Now as governor, uh, Mr. Kerner got off to a rocky start. As you indicated, the press relations <clears throat> not good when they started. Good man. Dick Thorne was a good man, but his experience was in radio. He did not know downstate Illinois. Bill Brooks was with, with uh, weekly newspapers, really good with weekly newspapers. He resigned his ownership, turned over to his son at Mount Sterling, Illinois, prior to the election. When Bill Brooks went into a downtown news, downstate newspaper, he had immediate respect, and he was there to, to promote Otto Kerner. And Bill Brooks nominally was not a Democrat. He really wasn't much of anything politically, but he liked Kerner in the state, really, had gotten tired of Governor Stratton. Now, in that race, uh, before, before that, on the press relations, when there were news conferences in the, in the Capitol, TV was not allowed when I first started there, or radio. They had a conference with the governor afterwards, so this was completely newspaper-oriented. And so you had, a, you had one assistant that had no experience with downstate newspapers, and another assistant experience was completely on radio. Now, it didn't work. And not too long after, maybe a year or so, they brought in Chris Flahopoulos, who was a tremendous press secretary, and also Bill Fuhrer. They both, they both knew downstate. They both knew the media because UPI covered TV and radio as well as newspapers, and, and they were good. The, in 1960, as an example of the governor's popularity and the Stratton's unpopularity, is that 
JFK carried Illinois 8,800 votes. Governor Kerner carried it by 500,000 votes. And it was, and it was uh, a tremendous victory by him and Paul Douglas who led the ticket. Now in 1964, uh, I believe Governor Kerner won for three reasons. One, himself, because he had worked so assiduously in some Republican areas downstate, many Republican areas really, worked the suburbs. I remember the night, the Saturday night before the primary, being with the governor campaigning at Evergreen Park. Tony Kerner was on that trip. And it was wonderful to see these suburban people come out and greet the governor. And then we had dinner at a Chinese restaurant where the governor was very popular. And you could see this ethnic group so solidified in their support of him and how they came up to him and hugged him and everything else. And it, you got the feeling that things were going his way. But he just, I think he won because of that, because of the Goldwater landslide, which I always call it Goldwater, not LBJ landslide, and Chris Flahopoulos. Chris Flahopoulos was, knew so much about all phases of state government, and he could communicate with people. And I would say Bill Fear was right behind him in that knowledge, and they knew from a complete broad view more what was going on in the Kerner administration than any two people. Uh, and, and then, the, and also by having Blahopis charge, uh, be in charge of things, uh, they eased Ted Isaacs out of the campaign because Ted Isaacs was indicted in the week of the World Series. And I remember coming back to St. Louis, one member of the card who worked for the governor said, we just lost the election, and really believed that. And we were all, and, and the, who favored the governor, were scared of that absolutely being true. Now, what, what I think the governor's main accomplishments, uh, I think mental health, education, and equal rights. And he was positively no phony on equal rights. I saw him at a cocktail party with the Illinois Bankers Association where a guy came up to him and really was reaming him out on FEPC legislation. The governor, uh, had, his eyes became moist. He didn't cry, he didn't have tears, but he was really charged up by this. And he let this guy know right then what his philosophy was, and, and he stuck by it uh, all, all that time. Uh, The, uh, uh, let me start. He's, uh, the governor won, by the way. He only won by uh, 50, he, he had 251% uh, uh, of the vote uh, over Percy. That's how, how close it was. And the, what, and the governor, I thought, was, a very, was an outstanding second term governor. Now, Ed Bedore asked a very interesting question about Mayor Daley. Well, the <clears> first t uh, term as reporter, I considered uh, the governor subservient to Mayor Daley. As a downstater, maybe I overranked that, possibly. But the second term, he was more of an independent. Uh, however, he still worked with Daley because Jim Ronan was the buffer. Mr. Ronan was the Democratic State Chairman, State Director of Finance, and he kept things in, in gear pretty, pretty much for a successful second term. Some people thought the governor might not have had a sense of humor. I beg the difference of that with a personal experience. The National Governor's Conference was in 1965 in Minneapolis. And the governor and the group of us went out for dinner two nights in a row at Charlie's Restaurant, a great restaurant there. And they we had a drink beforehand, and I, I was told about a beer that was pretty good, but it was really an ale called Glickstite. And so I had Glickstite then, during, and after the meal, and the others had some after dinner drinks. And the next night, the same thing happened. And uh, so the governor said, for Gene, he says, before, during, and after dinner drinks, Glickstite. And, and so his last day in office, Chris Flahopoulos called me and asked me to come see the governor. He wanted to talk to me. So the governor hands me this package all wrapped up nicely with a ribbon on it. And I said, well, thank you, governor. He said, no, I want you to open it. So I opened it. It was a six pack of Glickstein. <laughs> <laughs> that had happened three years earlier than that. <laughs> thank you, Gene. Mike? Okay. Well, I, uh, I was, uh, as Bob indicated, a, a young bull there, and as, as you can see, 
Um, and I really uh, was not regularly uh, stationed uh, in Springfield uh, during this period. I, shortly thereafter, uh, I, I went to Springfield and enjoyed uh, the State House uh, press room under the firm uh, rule of uh, Shelby Baskin cells. But uh, Governor Kerner had an impact uh, on my life, uh, mostly unintentional. It wasn't like he had a plan for me. But uh, first, uh, in Galesburg, I started out with the Galesburg paper, and that was at the time when the mental health reform uh, was being implemented. And uh, one of my beats was the State Research Hospital in Galesburg. And the uh, superintendent there was a psychiatrist named Tom Turlanis, uh, who was also uh, in charge of uh, the zone, as well as being in charge of the Galesburg Hospital. And they were doing some very interesting things uh, in mental health at the Galesburg Hospital. And uh, I uh, had the benefit of having a lot of access uh, to uh, personnel and even patients at the hospital. And uh, that really uh, kindled a strong interest in mental health that um, I carried with me uh, throughout uh, my professional uh, career. Now, Chris Vahopoulos, uh, when I did go to Springfield, I was going in and out, but Chris uh, was very um, welcoming uh, to me, and uh, Chris uh, early on made the mistake of saying, anything you need, pal, just let me know. <laughs> so uh, I had an editor, by then I'd moved to the, uh, a newspaper in Davenport, Iowa, but we covered Illinois, and I had an editor, uh, John McCormick, who uh, had uh, interviewed uh, the governor of Hughes at that time, and he made a big deal of that with me. And he asked, you know, he said, I think it'd be a good idea if you got an interview with Otto Kerner. Well, uh, Governor Kerner did, did not grant uh, many interviews one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So uh, when Chris said, uh, anything I can do for you, pal, I said, well, actually, Chris, there is something you can do for me. I, I uh, would like to interview uh, Governor Kerner. And he said, oh, I don't know about that. And I said, well, you said to me uh, any, anything you can do, uh, and this, this is what I want. And uh, he said, well, I'll get back to you. Well, I, I call him uh, usually uh, every week. Uh, to see how my request was uh, coming along, and I did get that interview with Governor Kerner. Now, I'd, I'd like to tell you that I, I got an outstanding uh, news nugget out of it or something that other journalists hadn't had, but that would not be true. I mean, it was a good story. It was a good interview. It was reflecting uh, on what he had accomplished and what he hoped to accomplish, but there was, there was really no sharp lead out, out of it. But I got the interview, and that uh, helped to uh, give me um, some uh, uh, points uh, with my editor at the Davenport paper. Now, I also uh, uh, was the benefit uh, of uh, a, a, something else that happened uh, involving Governor Kerner. Uh, we had urban riots, and we had uh, across the nation, but we also had uh, difficulties, unrest, civil unrest in Illinois. And uh, the Quad City area where I was experienced uh, some of that unrest uh, in the uh, African-American areas, and I had been involved in covering 
uh, that unrest and also uh, what uh, community leaders, both African American and white, were, were doing uh, to try to uh, address uh, uh, the problems that, that were there in, in the African American areas. While Governor Kerner came uh, to the Quad City area uh, to do a, uh, a boat trip that was sponsored by uh, development people in the area to showcase uh, the Quad Cities as a potential destination for business and also for tourism. And the governor did a press conference at the dock uh, before uh, he uh, uh, went on this boat trip. And of course, all the media were there and they were asking him que uh, you know, uh, questions about some of the unrest in Illinois. And uh, I remember at, at one point, there was a, a very aggressive uh, television reporter. He'd been a print reporter, moved to TV, named Dick Gage. And Dick Gage asked the governor several questions, just peppering him. And I remember at, at one point, the governor's answer was, Mr. Gage, you have asked me that same question six different ways and my answer hasn't changed and it won't change. <laughs> now, I remember that when I went to work for Governor Edgar and I sometimes was on the defense of uh, being peppered because I always thought at some point in the interview that was probably an appropriate thing to say. But what happened that night? Uh, after the news conference, I went on the boat and I got uh, ribbed by the other reporters there. They, they said, oh, well, you're going on a boat ride? That must be nice. Well, I figured if the governor uh, was in the Quad Cities, I wanted to be with him all the time he was there because you never knew what might happen. Well, we got out on the boat and um, I, I wasn't sure I could get a private interview with Governor Kerner. Now, he did know, know me from uh, that previous interview we had. But at one point, I noticed uh, that the governor was not on the boat. And I went up to one of the aides, it may have been Bill Fuhrer, who was with him, and I said, where's the governor? And uh, the aide said, uh, he'll be back and you're going to have a big story. And Governor Kerner came back on the boat and said, uh, I've just been named uh, to chair a national commission uh, looking at civil disorders. Uh, and um, what had happened was there was a boat behind us. They took the governor on that boat to a fire station in Andalusia, Illinois, where he took a call from President Johnson, uh, who was asking him to chair what obviously became known as the Kerner Commission. Well, uh, the governor made a few remarks to the people on the boat, and then I went up and asked him a couple of questions about it and how he felt about taking the assignment. Well, we get back near the dock and uh, the, now the media, the, the folks who were ribbing me for going on the uh, boat, uh, they're, 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 all they're all waiting there at the uh, dock. And then I heard the sweetest words I, I heard as a reporter, actually, I, I probably heard sweeter ones, but Kerner said, I don't want to deal with them and somehow they whisked him off the boat in a back way. So uh, everybody's waiting for Kerner to come off. He doesn't come off the boat, but I did. <laughs> and and, and they, they, they said, you know, the other reporters, where's Kerner? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know what, well, what did he say? What did he say? And I said, well, Guys, I think you're gonna to have to read about that tomorrow morning. <laughs> uh, and and uh, 
the uh, two two more things, and I, I won't dwell on them, uh, that made an impact on me. Um, I covered the hearing where Governor Kerner appealed for his pension uh, after uh, his uh, conviction, and uh, he did it with dignity, but it it was a uh, it was a, a, a real moment of poignancy. Uh, for me, and I'm sure for others, to see uh, Governor Kerner uh, making this appeal, and he was unsuccessful in it. And there, uh, there's going to be debate on how he got into that situation, and it can be handled elsewhere. But it drove home for me uh, what families go through and what the individual goes through a public official uh, when they find themselves in that situation. And I think it's a lesson, uh, regardless of how he got there, it's a lesson uh, that should have been learned by some people mm -hmm. who were in Springfield at the time and those who came later. And it, the lesson, unfortunately, I think is still unlearned. Uh, and. Uh, so uh, to end on a, a cheerier note, uh, I covered uh, the uh, uh, reception that they had for Governor Kerner uh, in Springfield. It was sponsored by leading Springfield uh, people uh, to thank Governor Kerner. And this was after his conviction. It was uh, in the final uh, years of his life, but it was a warm uh, event, and uh, praise uh, was showered on the governor for what he had done for Springfield and, and the state. And uh, I, I thought uh, it, it was uh, you know, very uh, well earned, and as has been alluded to here, uh, it stands out particularly given uh, what we've seen out of the last two governors and, and their relationship uh, with this town. So uh, I'll conclude with that and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Taylor? Thank you, Bob. Go Go Governor Kerner had a, uh, a very high uh, batting average, in my opinion, with the, uh, with the press. He had great press relations, very good. And that was largely attributable to the already much mentioned Chris Vahopoulos. Uh, Vahopoulos was really one of the most dynamic figures I think I encountered all my years in covering the State House. Now, I was very young and naive when the St. Louis Post Dispatch moved me from St. Louis to Springfield to be the Illinois political writer. I came in, I really knew more about Missouri politics than I did Illinois. I was uh, 24 years old at the time. And uh, immediately, I had a similar uh, experience as did Mike. Uh, Chris Vahopoulos welcomed me. Uh, the same thing, anything I can do for you, pal. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he meant it. And, and I, I, my, my early grounding in what was going on in the State House was really thanks to Chris. And I tried to you know, maintain my objectivity with him, but he was terrific. As Gene said, he understood state government. He had a great grasp of the state. He, had a, he was obviously in control of his relationships with the press room, and, and probably, you know, most importantly, uh, he was a, a confidant and a friend and a trusted advisor to the governor, and I think that's important in terms of the press secretary, because I think in terms of a successful governorship that you need a strong press office. And, and I would quickly point out that, <clears throat> because he's sitting next to me here on this panel, that the closest thing I've seen uh, in all my years around here, to Chris Vahopoulos is none other than Mike Lawrence. Uh, Jim Edgar, sitting back, Jim had a, a very successful, highly respected, highly regarded governorship, and Mike was a very important part of it. Because like Chris Vahopoulos, Mike had the ear of the governor, Mike was a confidant of the governor, he was a close friend of the governor, and when, when Mike spoke, you know you were speaking to Governor Edgar. The same thing was true with Chris Vahopoulos. Whatever Chris told you, you knew it was the governor talking because Chris knew all the issues and, and so on. Now, I don't want to repeat all the adjectives about Chris, but um, 
I had been probably in the state house about a month, and Chris uh, called up and said, you know, you haven't met the, the boss yet. Or, and I say this respectfully, Tony and Helena, he, he, Helena he might have said the old man. <laughs> he said, you haven't, you haven't met the old man yet. So he said, come on down. He's got a few minutes free, and uh, I'd like you to meet him. I had seen him a couple of times, but I really hadn't met him. So I go down, and it's very, very cordial and, and so on. And, and he, I think he right away told me that I'm pretty sure he said he had met Joseph Pulitzer III, who was the publisher of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and that uh, uh, he thought Pulitzer, as I recall, was a nice gentleman. And as I stood there right beside Kerner, I really thought to myself how much Kerner reminded me of Pulitzer in the dignified bearing, the, the military uh, discipline, the, the very sharp attire, uh, the square jaw, uh, the, 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 the dignified demeanor. And I thought, really, the, the two would, would, would be a lot alike. But anyway, uh, the governor took about five minutes, and Chris was standing there on small talk. And then I'll never forget, he took off on W. Russell Arrington. <laughs> now, W. Russell Arrington, for those of you who don't know, was the fiery, powerful leader of the Republican majority in the Illinois Senate and was a real potent figure in the Illinois State House in the 1960s. And Governor Kerner asked me if I'd met Arrington yet. I had not. And he gave me a bit of a lecture on Arrington, how Arrington had been an obstructionist on <laughs> so many of his programs. And Arrington was so parsimonious with the state's money. Arrington would not let Kerner uh, balance the budget. He wouldn't even go along with this little tiny increase in sales tax, this and that. So I really got an early grounding on, on W. Russell Arrington. And then uh, Kerner did add that he said he asked me if I had um, if I had met um, uh, uh, George Taggy, the, the, the Tribune political editor, and I said I really had not. And he said, "Well, I'm going to find him to be a, a very negative individual, <laughs> and he just doesn't seem he just doesn't seem to grasp what I'm trying to do with this state. You know, it doesn't matter what I do. The community college program had been set up, as has been explained. The mental health system reformed, uh, and 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 so on." And, and yet, uh, it, this, this guy just is, is a problem, and I just don't, I just don't understand it. But uh, anyway, I, I should point out that, that Kerner was a dream governor for the Post-Dispatch. He was everything the Post-Dispatch thought a governor should be. He was a Democrat. He was progressive. <laughs> he had a great military record. He was very supportive of civil rights legislation. He was on the right side in the then burgeoning environmental issues. So Kerner was, you know, the prototype of what the post-dispatch hierarchy and especially the editorial writers thought, you know, a governor should be. Uh, again, in emphasizing the, uh, the, 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 the prowess and the all-encompassing nature of Crystal Hopeless, uh, I, I do want to point out that it, it's important because the, the, uh, in the Kerner years, I was pretty much uh, getting acclimated here. Uh, it took me a while to get, I was very green. It took me a while to get my footing, to, to figure out to some degree what maybe is going on. And so I pretty much wrote straight news in those years. I tried to digest everything I could. For example, I was an avid reader of Gene Callahan's columns in the State Register. I uh, got a lot of tips, Gene, thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of stories affecting downstate Illinois. But uh, I, I, I really didn't get into my uh, uh, interpretive analytical stuff and, and uh, investigative pieces until uh, my coverage of the Ogilvy and Walker years. And I might point out that in those years, they did not have, uh, they did not have a Chris Hopless nor, nor a Mike Lawrence. Uh, uh, Ogilvy, um, the, the press office in, in those two governorships, in my view, was not, was not as strong as it was under Kerner and under Governor Edgar. Uh, the, uh, in, in Ogilvy's case, Ogilvy himself was very adept with the press. Uh, he was very good at handling the press himself, as was later Governor Jim Thompson. And, and Ogilvy offset maybe a, a somewhat weak press office with his own uh, inner understandings. He had a great insight into the inner workings of, the, um, of newspapers and also of broadcast media. And that was interesting, and I think maybe Gene Callahan referred to it, that when I first came up here, it's hard to believe that the broadcast media were not allowed in press conferences. Uh, it was only the newspaper people. And then when the press conferences would end, uh, the radio guys and the TV cameramen would be waiting outside, and then they would interview 
us, the reporters, who had just been in there with Governor Kern. I thought that was very interesting. Sometimes Governor Kern himself would come out and answer questions, but, but not all the time. I will point out that, that that situation quickly changed when Ogilvy became governor in, in a matter of hours, immediately radio, television stations and, and uh, radio uh, reporters were allowed ready access to the press conferences. You know, I, 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 I always felt that, uh, I, I, was very, I was very impressed with Governor Kerner, and, and although I was supposed to be objective and felt I was objective, I sort of took pride in, in the fact that, that, that we had a governor like Kerner. Uh, several times I would cover, there would be meetings between Governor Kerner and then Governor Warren Hearns of Missouri on air pollution issues in the St. Louis area and other subjects. And I was always, and I got to cover those, and I was always very impressed with the way that, uh, with, with the way that Governor Kerner conducted himself. He just always seemed to be, you know, the class act, the one that, uh, you know, just brought a lot more to the, more to the table. And I want to, I, I want to um, elaborate uh, uh, on one situation I had, uh, when you talk about having access to Governor Kerner, um, uh, Mike was right and, and Gene probably agreed that uh, uh, he didn't really give many exclusive interviews that I recall and a lot of reporters didn't get much time with him. Well, I had been here about a year and a half and the editors of St. Louis called and said, we'd like a profile on Governor Kerner. And I said, okay. They said, let's go into some detail on, on the governor, maybe on his family and, and, and things like this. I said, fine. So, so right away I go downstairs to the press room because Chris, this is, this is the deal. They, they want this. Can I, can I get a little time alone with, with the governor? And Chris says, I'll tell you, pal, here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Bill Barnhart, Bill Barnhart <laughs> talked about the feds awarding us that, that, that nuclear accelerator up there by Batavia that became known as Fermilab. Okay, at that time, this was probably about 19, late 66, 67, it was known that Illinois was being awarded this, this uh, uh, facility, which was a, a high risk, uh, a high energy physics facility. Very complicated, and like you and others, I had no understanding of it at all. But it was a big deal. Okay. <coughs> Chris says, a couple of days, the governor is going to spend an evening and part of the next day with, with Glenn Seberg, uh, who was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, which was overseeing the project. And he said, Seberg is flying into Chicago and he's going to spend time with the governor uh, on going over details about, you know, loose ends and all that, because we've got this thing locked up, but Seberg just wants to feel comfortable about various aspects of it. So, Chris says, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's you and I go along. I said, that'd be great. He said, yeah, we'll trail the governor, and, and you, can be, you can be with him, and you can watch him in action. He says, I think it's important you see the governor in action. And I said, this is just great, great. Chris said, so we'll go together. And, uh, uh, and, like, and he said, now the only thing is, he said, we gotta be a little sensitive with, uh, we don't wanna be, the, the Chicago reporters may be hanging around, and we don't want, you to be getting information they won't get. And then he said, but the most important thing is, don't tell anybody else in the press room that we're doing this. <laughs> because he said, I'll have hell to pay. <clears throat> okay, all right. So the next day, the, the appointed hour, I go out to, to, to the airport in Springfield and I, I get on the state plane. And on the state plane are only two people, Governor Kerner and Gene Graves, who was the, the state's economic development director under Kerner. And right away I said to Green, where's Chris? And Gene says, oh, Chris isn't going to come. <laughs> He's got things to do in the state house. <laughs> and, and, and Grace said, but don't worry. You're going to be with the governor at all times. In fact, you're eating with the governor and Seberg tonight. And so I thought, well, this is, you know, I, I wasn't sure about this, but I thought, well, this is kind of unbelievable. So it, it was exactly as, as Chris and, and, and Gene and, and Grace said. I was with Kerner. I, I was with Kerner when, when, he, when he greeted Seberg. Uh, I can't remember, I think it was at a motel um, where everybody was staying. And, uh, and uh, uh, the governor introduced me to Seberg briefly, and I think, he had, I think he introduced me as a newspaper reporter, I think, because Seberg never got it straight. And that was very kind of awkward the rest of my time, because Seberg, first of all, after briefly shaking my hand with a nod, uh, Seberg never again over that evening and the next day ever said a word to me. I was kind of like the invisible man. 
<clears throat> so anyway, and you have to remember, Seberg uh, was a Nobel winning chemist. Uh, he was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, and he had helped develop the atomic bomb. So this was a pretty prestigious guy. So anyway, that night we had the dinner, at the, and, and their, their dinner, Kerner, Seberg, and me. <laughs> This is, this is, and, and listen, this is, I hope you appreciate the awkwardness of this. So, and obviously Chris had said, and I, would, and I wouldn't, of course, say, don't dare t try to take a note or anything, you know, and I wouldn't, I didn't do that. Chris said, whatever you hear, if you, you want to pick up, uh, you know, take the notes back, back in the motel room after, after the, you know, the evening's over. But anyway, um, so I sat there through about an hour and a half dinner with the governor and Glenn Seberg, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, and it was very interesting. Seberg was talking about Kennedy. I think Kennedy had named him uh, AEC chair and talking about Lyndon Johnson, who was president at the time. Interesting insights. And, and, and the governor, he went back and forth. And Seberg was asking to make sure there was no red tape in, ter in terms of local officials in Cook County and so on about, about getting this thing set up. And it was, it was very interesting. I thought, man, if I was a Washington columnist, this would be a gold mine, you know, the stuff I heard. And the interesting thing was, at, it, it, and I still think about this, that Seberg never acknowledged me or hardly ever looked at me. <laughs> and it, I was sitting there, and just, again, like the invisible man. And later on, I felt that Seberg must have thought I was either a young Kerner staffer or maybe a young plainclothes state cop <laughs> in, 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 in Kerner's security detail. So anyway, we come the next morning, and Graves was there at breakfast. And, 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 and Graves says, come on, sit with Seberg. And the governor and Seberg are sitting here early. And I walk in, and, and Graves says, go sit with him. And I said, no. I, I, I sat at the next table with a state trooper. I just felt this was really, I felt this was, this is really, this is really, really weird, you know? So anyway, uh, th th then Seberg wanted to take a driving tour of the site, which I think was near Batavia. Is that right? OK. And, and uh, anyway. I had a chance to ride in the car with the, with the governor and Seberg, but I declined. I rode in one of the back cars, again, with a state trooper and, and somebody else. And it was just interesting that nobody on the scene really picked up the fact that I was a newspaper reporter. <laughs> but anyway, on the way back on the plane, I finally got what I really came for. Uh, I, I, got, I, I had the governor alone, and, and it was very beneficial. I got to ask him questions, and that was maybe the most pleasant uh, hour, a little over an hour I spent with the governor. I did take notes. Uh, we talked about um, uh, his, uh, uh, his, his education. We talked about his war record. I remember we talked about his relationship with General William Westmoreland, who was our uh, top commander in Vietnam for years. Kerner was close to Westmoreland. Uh, you know, we talked about some legislative things. Uh, thank goodness we didn't talk about Arrington, <laughs> and, we did, and we didn't talk about Taggy. But uh, I got a rare opportunity. I, I didn't know how far to press, but I, 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 I went into, uh, you know, the Cermak family, and uh, I, I wanted to know a little bit of what he would reminisce about Mayor Cermak, and of course about um, uh, Mrs. Kerner. And, that, and he talked a little bit about Tony and Helena, who are both here today, sitting right here. And, and it, was, it was really, really quite pleasant. And it was, uh, I thought, a, one of the best hours I'd ever, as a reporter, spent with, uh, you know, with, with a governor. And I just, uh, after that, I had uh, that personal information uh, uh, certainly sufficed for the profile I wrote. And then, Later on, in many things that enveloped later, and when I would write about Otto Kerner and so on, of course, I was able to still draw about, about some of that stuff. I, being interested in history, of course, I was fascinated with the whole, you know, Mayor Cermak situation, and I thought it was great that, uh, that, uh, that, that it gave me an opportunity to go into some aspects of the Cermak family with, with Kerner, as well as uh, some things uh, concerning his father, Otto Kerner Sr., who had been uh, a distinguished attorney general of Illinois. And uh, that was just, as I said, one of my fondest memories of, of, of Otto Kerner, who I greatly did, uh, I greatly did in those days, I greatly did admire. Thank you, Taylor. Jack? I'm uh, interested in our bar mitzvah pictures up there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Apparently, they wanted us to look the way we did when Carter was governor. So, and uh, speaking of bar mitzvah, being here at the Abraham Lincoln Library makes me think of my good friend, federal judge Abraham Lincoln Maravitz. And uh, he and I were talking one time, and he told me how he came to be named Abraham Lincoln. He said he asked his mother, why did you name me Abraham Lincoln? Why my Abraham Lincoln Maravitz? She said, because Abraham Lincoln was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> 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 so Judge Abe said, uh, where did you get that? Where did you get that idea? She said, well, he was shot in the temple, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I, I, I believe that. <laughs> but, uh, my first uh, encounter with the Kerners was the inaugural in 1961. And I remember two things about it very, very well. Uh, one was that uh, Anton, who was a little boy, went about introducing himself, dressed beautifully, wonderful manners. Hello, I'm Anton Kerner, and would shake hands and so on. I re I, and then I encountered uh, Anton and Helena some years later, and their conversation was to the effect that their father had been treated horribly by the justice system, that this was a gross injustice. And then it was nice to see them again, again last night. My own feeling about what happened to Otto Kerner was it was, um, with uh, due respect to Theodore Dreiser, it was an American tragedy. A, a brilliant, talented man who brought so much to our state and did so much for our state. Of course, as a, a news anchor, uh, I did not voice or let those opinions be known. Uh, WGN, in the 26 years I worked there, uh, the idea was fairness, objectivity. Uh, we were not to insert our views into anything. And uh, I think I did that successfully um, after many years of being on the air there, I've had ultra-conservative people say to me, I always like the fact you're one of us, or liberals say the same thing. And I, I was pleased that they didn't know how I really felt. Um, things have changed in the news business, where now the co-founder with Ted Turner of CNN said if I had to do it over again, I'd go in the opinion business to hell that tried to be objective or fair about it. And there's a lot of money. Uh, you look at uh, Bill O'Reilly, 20 million a year. Uh, Rush Limbaugh, probably more than that. There's more money in uh, raising hell on the air than there is in trying to shed some light. But uh, that, that is a, another, another subject. What I, I think is very ironic in the Otto Kerner story, sort of what goes around, comes around. Governor Kerner became prominent and well-known and capable of achieving high elective office by prosecuting Preston Tucker. Tucker, as many of you probably know, had an automobile that was years ahead of its time, and people were crazy to buy this car. The big three were still building what they had done before the war. But Tucker had a totally different automobile that he tried to produce unsuccessfully. Um, he allegedly broke some laws. One of the things I recall he did, uh, he took investors' money to take people on his yacht. And it's illegal to use investors' money to try and get more investment. <coughs> that was one of the things that he allegedly did. But Otto Kerner became prominent because he was the DA who went after Preston Tucker, who incidentally was found not guilty. Uh, Otto Kerner was brought down by a very aggressive young DA who became prominent enough to become governor of Illinois, his name Jim Thompson. So I find it very ironic that Kerner became eligible to become governor and by prosecuting a guy. In the meantime, the governor was prosecuted by a very aggressive DA who 
became the governor of, of, of Illinois. I uh, think it might be interesting to you and a little bit helpful to know more than you perhaps know about Marge Everett. Uh, Marge Everett was complicit in the downfall of, of Governor Kerner in that um, she allegedly bribed him and that was a, a key factor in the conviction of the governor. Uh, she wanted better racing dates and she made stock options available to Governor Kerner and uh, she said in the trial that uh, she did not intend to bribe him. And of course, he denied that it was a bribe, but the conviction indicated that people felt differently ab uh, about that. Marge Everett uh, was uh, adopted by Ben Lindheimer. Ben Lindheimer owned Arlington Park and Washington Park. And Marge uh, took to racing like a duck to water. She Tell Georgia, who knew her very well, said she never really loved anybody but her dog did. But she loved that racetrack and she loved racing. And Marge did whatever she could to try to make a more successful operation out of those, out of those racetracks. Uh, she played the media like a fiddle. Uh, and I, I was involved in that to some extent. Uh, Marge liked me a lot, and, and I, I liked her. Uh, one of the reasons she liked me was uh, she was a big fan of Nat Brandywine. And Nat Brandywine had a kind of a poor man's Guy Lombardo kind of orchestra. I don't know why Marge liked him so much. But anyway, she wanted an album that was out of print, and I talked to WG, an engineer, into making an album for her. Well, you would have thought I had given her the moon, you know, but she. And, and she courted the media as well as people in the government. Uh, she used to have parties in the evening at Arlington Park for media people. And you'd have a, a lovely dinner. I'd get there late and she'd say, oh, oh, Jack, and she'd run the kitchen and get food for me. It was, it was always very, very nice to me. But to everybody who could be helpful to her. And, but she later got into some more trouble, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Well, what, they, what she would do, she'd have these lovely cocktail hour and a, a big party for the media. And afterward, they'd run races, and we'd all be given play money. And we would make bets on these races. And at the end of the evening, you could turn your play money in for big TV sets, luggage, really expensive stuff. And uh, if you didn't get the right horse, didn't have much play money, She'd say, well, here, you, you, you take this TV home. You, uh, uh, this was wrong, of course. We weren't thinking much about it at the time. The money should have gone to Chicago Tribune, sometimes WBBM, for advertising, rather than essentially bribing us because people who wrote columns and had talk shows and so on spoke favorably about Arlington after having been given a big TV set. And Marge, however, um, she was not all wise by any means, as we know in retrospect. Charles Bluedhorn, who was the CEO of one of America's first big conglomerates, Gulf and Western, called Marge one day. And Marge was building the um, hotel right next to the track and she's running a little short of money. And uh, Bluedhorn said, I, I hear you're building a big hotel, running a little short. She said, that was true. So said, why don't we do something here? We have tons of money. We don't know anything about raising. We'll buy your racetrack, and then you'll have all the money you need. And uh, well, we don't know anything about racing, so you run it. So she made the deal with Gulf and Western. She sold to them. And there's an old saying that um, he who pays the fiddler calls the tune. And about three years later, Marge was gone. Gulf and Western got rid of her and put her own, their own people in there. So Marge Everett went west, and uh, 
she became the CEO of uh, Hollywood Park. Uh, and she did the same kind of thing out there. Uh, but she got in trouble with the board because of what she was doing with the governor of California then, Governor Reagan. Big box right on the finish line for Reagan. Uh, put big TVs in their home, gave them all kinds of gifts and so on. So it was Marge's uh, operation, way of operating to try to get the best situation from the government she could. Now, I have no way, obviously never had a way of looking into the hearts and minds of Marge Everett and Governor Kerner. I think that they probably thought this was private enterprise being friendly with government to the mutual benefit of both of them. Um, Marge testified in court that she never intended to bribe Otto Kerner. And my feeling of what I knew about Governor Kerner was that he was above that kind of thing. I, I, I guess, and I have no way of knowing this, of course, that in, in his heart he really didn't feel that he had been, been bribed or, or, or corrupted by her. But that's just my own feeling, and, and everybody has his or home, his or her own uh, ideas about it. I just want to say before uh, I conclude my remarks that um, I'm honored to be here with you ink-stained wretches. <laughs> uh, there was a time when the newspaper people were not very friendly toward the television people, and I, I really didn't, didn't know that the reporters had to interview the newspaper people to find out what, what was going on. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when television news anchors were becoming more prominent than the newspaper people didn't like them very much. Mm -hmm. uh, they felt with some justification that a lot of them didn't know what the hell they were talking about <laughs> and that the newspaper people generally worked harder, were better informed, and that the TV people were I had makeup and were blow dried and read teleprompters and aside from that didn't know much about what was going on. And I'm sorry to remember his name at the moment, but he was the um, uh, press secretary for Eisenhower, became the head of ABC News. Jim right? Haggerty. Haggerty, yeah. right, right. And he said, we're, we're going to change this. We're, we're not going to have these uh, good looking, fancy pants young guys on the camera. We're going to have real honest to God journalists. And he hired a bunch of newspaper people. And sorry, fellas, but it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were a few people in our industry, Edward R. Murrow was one, Walter Cronkite, who had the dual advantage of being very good journalists, very good writers, knew what they were doing, but they're also good showmen. And, and I have to say, I, you, you guys are good showmen, too. <laughs> I very much enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got some time left for uh, questions.